Hey, I want to welcome everybody back. I'm so sorry about our technical difficulties. It is uh, a learning curve. Upgrading. So that we can get sound on here. So I want to make sure that somebody back there who is listening has sound. And uh, I just thank you for being here right now. And thank you. Father in heaven, I pray thank you'd be you, with Lord. us. I'm sorry we started late. I'll make sure that we end it uh, a little bit more appropriately and on time. Thank you very much for being with us. Please join us in in service now. Thank you. Okay. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for Pentecost Sunday, Lord.
Sunday, 49 days after the day of Easter, Jesus told them as they were waiting around in Jerusalem, hiding in the upper room, he said, tarry, go to Jerusalem, go to the holy city, and tarry, and wait for me, wait for me, and then he told them about the promise that he would send, he said, I'm going to be leaving, but fear not, because I send you the promise of my Father, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Lord. Calling. 
thank you for this time. Anoint the pastor while he preaches the word and we hear from you. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, uh, can you hear? Can you hear? Yeah. Okay, let me see. Uh, Timothy, I may be able to use this. Does this one work? Okay. All right. Hey, listen, so uh, I'm just talking to you through the straight up Mevo now. You know what? Uh, we're trying our sound and everything, so please be with us. It'll take us another week to get the kinks out. Thank you so much, and thank you for being here with us at City Limits. There are a few people here, I'm not going to lie to you, they are scattered around and sitting nicely and neatly, and uh, I'm just so thankful for that. I always love it when people come in and join us. Give me a moment, as always, just to get to my technology. I have to tell it not to turn off on me, um, or else it will, and I'll be stuck without a sermon, <laughs> and that's never a good thing. Excuse me a moment. Thank you, right here. Thank you, Brother Terrell, and all of you. Thank you, Father. We come before you, Lord, today, and we pray that you will be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like if the uh, techies could be back there, if they could check and make sure that the sermon is coming out clearly. So I'll give you a few minutes of that. I'll just make a few announcements. Uh, the uh, first announcement I want to make, I think it should be on there already, is the prayer line on there? Okay, I should have a little prayer line on there. If it's not on there, it's okay. Okay, yeah, the prayer line is on there. Yes, it's not on that one, Tim. And uh, it, it's on the others. So so if you want to, please send your prayer request to uh, citylimitsag at msn.com. And uh, I can't tell you how serious and strong this is to us. We want to hear from you. We want to pray for you. We know, I know there's a sister in Jersey, uh, my cousin's friend, and she's got cancer, stage four, and I want to pray for her, and I want to pray for my uncle, I want to pray for my family, I want to pray for all these riots and everything that's going on. Uh, you know, uh, what happened there, every person's got to take a position. It doesn't matter if you're a Democrat, a Republican, Puerto Rican, black, white, Chinese, Asian, American, or whatever it is. You know, if you're small, if you're large, fat, skinny, it doesn't matter what happened to that poor man for eight minutes was wrong. And, 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 and so we pray that justice will be served and, and that it'll also send a signal. All this violence will send some kind of a signal that, that this is just not a generation that is willing to put up with it any, anymore. And so I thank you for that. Uh, today I wanted to share some, um, thoughts with you. I have some things. On Pentecost and so um, I'm going to be asking you to go to a few different scripture at the same time the first one I want you to go to found right here here we go John chapter 15 verse 26 John chapter 15 he says but the advocate the Holy Spirit whom the Father he will send in my name I need you to remember that in my name, he will send it in my name, in Jesus name, not, not Jimmy, in my name, he will be with you forever, forever. And, 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 and I need to wrap this around in the context that to this point, our Jesus has got his disciples, everybody's seeing his miracles and they're seeing everything happening, but something that they're not seeing, then they see Jesus crucified. They see him beaten. They see him stripped. They see him humbled. They see all these things, jailed and prison, everything, you know, and, and, and then they run and they hide in the upper room and they stay there and they're just kind of hiding all together. Almost can't be found, almost can't be heard from. Even Peter, he denies him and says, he's not the one. I don't know him. I don't know him. I don't know him. But Jesus was trying to show us something. He's trying to show that, uh, that, you know, even in those last times, people would need him. We need 
the presence of God. Now, let me just say that right now. Pentecost Sunday, we need the presence of God. To try to do this in the flesh is like paddling uh, some kind of a canoe and not having an oar. It's like trying to get a sailboat and not having a sail. It's like having a big old steamer and not having an engine on it, a rudder on it. You know, we just can't do it. It's like having a car and not having gas. We need something in us. And Jesus has done that. Since the beginning of time, if you look at human history, look around at all of the great civilizations. As you take a look, is there's one cry that you're going to find uh, that's louder than any other cry. And that is that man is essentially empty. There's a vacancy. There's a vacuum in every one of us. There's something missing, something that we need. I can prove it to you. When the Titanic had gone down, they went down there and they wanted to see what they could get. Salvage boats are out all over the coastlines in the Bahamas. They're all looking for something more. Why? We're unsatisfied. It, 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 it just, we're not satisfied with what God. Some of us will get to be 58, 59, 60 years old and say, my goodness, oh man, is that all there is? Is that it? I mean, is that it? Uh, 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 you know, I, I, I have nothing to, I have nothing to show for it. I'll take you a step further. Go back to the pharaohs. Go to the kingdoms. Go to the pharaohs. Go to the pyramids. Go to the statues. Everything they had. They always thought there must be something more. I've got to make a statue of Caesar. I've got to make a statue of this. I've got to leave something after I'm gone. Why? Because there's got to be something more. Man has always felt this vacancy, this vacuum, and this emptiness in his soul. Every society... Every society goes through it. Every society has this drive and this drive to find something more. Is there anything for me? Why? Because we're, we're basically a selfish people. And, and so there's something in us that's driving. What's in it for me? W-I-I-F-M, I call it. What's in it for, for me? And now this can be a good thing or this can be a horrible thing. This drive for wanting to know this drive, for wanting more, this drying, uh, this driving for uh, uh, to fill the vacuum. It can be horrible because it can make us selfish, self-centered, and it can just make us me, 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 me. Or, or it can light up inside of us something that teaches us to seek. Think of the Buddhist and think of the people in transcendental all the people on meditation, all the people on yoga, all the people on every kind of Hinduism, anything they can find. Why? Everybody's looking. There's got to be something more of all this strain and suffering and happiness, joy, all the mixtures of life. There's got to be something more. I think Solomon wrote it best almost at the end of his life. He said this. Uh, he said, a vanity of vanities. All is vanity. He says in another verse, it's written at the end of his life. All is vanity. Emptiness. All is vanity. It's a vexation of the spirit. It doesn't help me at the end. It frustrates me. I feel like I've got so much to show. And yet it frustrates me that after all this time, I have nothing to show. It's all vanity. I've had it all. I think of Solomon, the man who had everything, the richest man in the kingdom known. And yet. He says at the end of his life, having everything, but not having this void filled inside of me, not having this emptiness filled inside of me, it makes me feel like I'm nothing. I get to it before many centuries, two thirds of the Bible talks about how men and people always talked about how they could just feel, uh, see God, see God, how they could see God and they went and they followed God and God called them and they just went and they didn't know inside something drew them, something compelled them to go from the inside. And as you think about that, I want you to think that God from the beginning, God sent his Holy Spirit and he guided people. He sent his Holy Spirit. He directed people. He sent his Holy Spirit. He gave people insight. He gave them all of the discernment. He gave them courage. He did all these things. God did these things. The two-thirds, the first two-thirds of the Bible, God shows that he gave all these things. 
but it was just a prelude, a pretext of what God had planned because God knew that we needed more and he was going to give us more. Not only was I going to be led by the Spirit, not only would I be guided by the Spirit, not only could I be blessed by the Spirit, but he wanted me to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and, and I need you to know that now. There's so many people. The, the, the worst thing that could happen is that Pentecost and Azusa Street and the 1970s and all the charismatic, that it all goes into a museum of this is what happened in church history. This is what happened as we went through church. It would be a shame, a travesty, if that's what Pentecost came to when Jesus himself, and I'm going to show you in scripture in a few minutes, Jesus himself said from the beginning, it was his plan. I don't only want to guide, I don't only want to speak, I don't only want to direct, I don't only want to give you impressions, but I want to be right with you you and that's the promise of Jesus you know it's like a a big giant locomotive train it's coming at you you can hear it and you can hear the uh trending and the smoke and the uh, wheels turning and everything but you can't see it yet I hear it coming but I can't see it yet and I want you to know that that's the same thing that happened on the day of Pentecost there was this great noise this loud noise this thundering noise that moved upon all the people that were there in that room and I want to prove some things to you today for those of you that are naysayers uh, we are a Pentecostal church a Pentecostal ministry, we are redevoting ourselves to allowing the gifts of the Spirit to move in this place, to move in our life, and to move in our city. He says this, Joel says, it's going to touch your sons and your daughters, it's going to touch your old men, it's going to touch the young men, it's going to touch everybody, everybody's going to be affected by this. 600 years uh, the prophet Isaiah says, even before, even before anything happened, this is Old Testament, 600 years, prophet Isaiah says, and they will show this with stammering lips in a foreign town. With stammering lips, they will show their love for God. How could Isaiah know this? I mean, he didn't even know about Jesus yet. How could he know that this was going to happen on the day of Pentecost? Because he knew that God had something more for us. Joel told us, he said, uh, what would happen? He said, uh, I baptize, uh, he said, he said, uh, what would happen? And what would happen is I'll pour out my spirit. Isaiah told us how it would happen. Now, he said, with stammering lips. Then number three, John the Baptist told us who would make it happen. And he said this, he said, I baptize you in water. For repentance, but there is one coming whose shoes I'm not worthy to latch it. And that is Jesus. And he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and in fire. So Joel told us, he said what would happen. Isaiah told us how it would happen. John the Baptist told us who's going to make it happen. And then Jesus says, I'm going to tell you when it's going to happen. When you gather together, when you gather in the upper room, when you're praying. I tell you folks, the one thing that we got to remember is that those people weren't in that upper room crying tears. Listen, there may have been some sorrow about that, about that crucifixion, but they were, uh, they were praying. They were praying, and we need to be a praying church if we want to see the power of the Holy Spirit move. We need to be a crying church. We need to be a passionate church. We need to be a singing and a worshiping and a loving God church if we want to see the promise of the Father. Then Jesus says, he says, I'm going to tell you how it's going to happen. He said, behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, so go and tarry in the city of Jerusalem until I come and visit you with that power. So this is just the first day of Pentecost. There's going to be excitement. There's going to be people that get excited about that day. There's going to be, a, there's going to be people that say that this day is not for now. It was only for then. I'm going to prove that wrong through the word of God, not Jimmy. I'm going to prove that wrong. It says that on the day of Pentecost, suddenly, and suddenly, and by suddenly, it usually means it's a surprise. 
But not in this sense. It doesn't mean it was, a, it was a surprise because it happened. Boom, at that moment. But to the people that were there in the upper room, they had been praying. Hallelujah. They had been singing. Hallelujah. They had been talking about Jesus. Hallelujah. They had been talking about the miracles. They had been talking about the signs. They had been talking about the wonders. They had been talking about his words. And suddenly, while they were doing the right thing, uh, suddenly there came the sound of a rushing wind. Come on. Somebody lift your hands at home. I said, there came the sound of a rushing wind. Uh, a rushing wind came upon them. They came the sound of a rushing wind. And it filled the house. It filled it. And, and, and tongues of fire came and sat upon them. <laughs> Why? tongues of fire come and sit upon them in the book of Acts chapter 2 what you're going to see is when they're in the upper room tongues of fire come and sit upon them but in the book of Acts chapter 4 Acts chapter 9 Acts chapter 19 you're going to see that there were no fire and they still got baptized why not hmm kind of makes you wonder doesn't it why not because according to the Old Testament if there was a new covenant, a new contract, if the old one is torn apart, and Jesus said, I didn't come to tear it apart or to rip it. I came to complete it. But in order to complete it, I've got to set that old covenant aside. I'm not just going to guide and direct you and bless you. I'm going to fill you. I'm going to be with you. There needs to be a new contract. Every new covenant was sealed by fire. So that means every time somebody gets baptized, there's not going to be cloven tongues on them. They're going to be baptized because the covenant's already been made. The new covenant that I'm not only going to fill and guide and bless, I'm going to fill you and I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be right with you till the end of the age. I'm going to be your advocate. I'm going to be your paraclete. I'm going to be the one that is with you till the end. In the flesh, we cannot walk this walk. In the flesh, we cannot do this walk. In the flesh, we cannot pray for our kids. In the flesh, we cannot pray for healing. In the flesh, we can't believe for healing. We've got to pray in the power of the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Ghost and believing that we are Pentecostals, that we are filled with the Spirit, that we are filled to the full. And I hope to overflow with the promise that God the Father has sent us. You would not believe. I could tell you and you wouldn't believe it. I was up all morning worried. So let's talk about this a little bit. Jesus raised three people during his life. Now there's many more, but let's just talk about three. On one is the son of a widow of the woman at nine. And uh, he, was on, he was on his way to the grave on a stretcher and they were carrying this young boy. He's being taken to his funeral to be put into, into the ground, into the hole. And he touches that young man saying to him, I say to you, a young man, arise. The young man was on his way to the grave. He was on his way to his plot. But the young man, he arose from the dead. That's a resurrection. Are you following? That's the power to bring something that is dead back to life. To bring it back to life. Jesus does that. Well, it's just okay. So he did a miracle. Number two. On the second one, he was at the house of Jarvis and his little girl. She was sick. He walks into the house. And there was people already because they would hire mourners and they would wail. And, oh, oh, the pain, the sorry of a little girl dying. And they would wail because of the loss of this man and of his dear little daughter. Jesus walked in this room and he said, damsel, damsel, I say to thee, arise from the dead. He took her by the arise from the dead. This morning, they couldn't believe that he could turn. These, all these mourners thought he was crazy. 
These mourners thought he was nuts. These mourners thought it was unbelievable that he could say to Jarvis' daughter, Arise, arise, raise yourself, raise yourself, stand up and walk because you are alive. We take you to another one. On the third one is his friend Lazarus. We all know this one very well. His friend Lazarus. And we know that he goes away uh, to Bethany a few days. So he's away. So he's in the grave not only three days but four days. So he's probably smelling a little bit by this point. He's wrapped in his grave, closed and embalmed and all. Lazarus. There's a mass of people outside, and the third one is Lazarus. Lazarus had already been in the grave. He was already buried. He was already entombed. He was already wrapped up. He was already, everything had been done for him. It was already closed. It was a closed tomb. It was done. Martha and Mary have an aching heart at this point. Like, like, like uh, this is too late. He's dead. He's dead. And they say to Jesus, Jesus, if only you had been here. If only you had been here two days earlier, you could have stopped this. If only you had been here two days earlier, you could have stopped this. Oh, listen up, church. Oh. Woo. Uh, he says, he says to Mary, I tell you that he is not alive, but he will rise. Stop. Period. She says to Jesus, I know. Let me repeat myself. I know. Let me repeat my. I know that in the resurrection he will rise. Let me repeat that. I know that in the resurrection he will rise, Jesus. And Jesus said to her, I say to you, Mary, I am the resurrection and the life. He'll rise right now. <laughs> Open the tomb. Lazarus, come out. Take off his grave clothes. That man's not dead. He's alive. Alive, alive, alive. He is the resurrection because he rose. He proved that we could be raised and that we have a resurrection power in us. There's a dunamis. There's a power in us that we need to relight. Born again people, Christian people, old people say, I've been baptized 50 years. You need to, there needs to be a fresh anointing, a fresh baptism for this brand new world. We need to be re-anointed and refilled and baptized again, afresh, anew, and keep on being baptized in the Holy Spirit so that we can make it to the end of this journey. Hallelujah. Jesus said to Martha, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. And here's Peter preaching in Acts chapter 4. God raised him up. He breaks bodies. He stole it. But I want to give you some good news on this Pentecostal Sunday. That he not only rose them from the grave. He not only rose them. There's a little scripture Matthew 27, I, I believe it's 47, it's, it's, it's where Jesus is crucified and he dies and the tombs open up. Anybody seen it? Matthew 27, Matthew 27, come on, find that it's about at the end there where Jesus says it's finished and the earthquake comes and the tombs open up. <laughs> Let me tell you what happens. It says, and the tombs, oh here, I'm, I'm so sorry here, I could, I, 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 I could give this right to you. Matthew 27, 51, at that moment, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. The veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. The earth quaked and the rocks split open. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many saints who had fallen asleep, they raised after Jesus, his resurrection. When they had come out of the tombs, they entered into the holy city and they appeared to many people. I'm not just talking about a baby boy and a baby girl and about a man named Lazarus. I'm talking about the resurrection power of Jesus. Christ, the dunamis power of Jesus Christ must have been so powerful that it could not only, listen, as he went down, everything broke open and resurrection had already started when he died, it already started, he had just paid the price, it was already done it was finished, and when it's finished it means resurrection begins the tombs 
door. Can you imagine? I buried my grandfather. He's knocking at the door. Can you imagine those people? They went into the holy city and showed themselves. Here I am. Now listen. We don't know. I don't know how long people last. People have been saved. People have been healed. People have been saved. And they still died. There was uh, Elisha and Enoch. They went off and they disappeared. I don't know. I don't know if they did. I don't know what happened. But what I know is this. That he is the resurrection and the life. Can somebody say amen? amen. Come on now. I want to share a little something else with you that I feel is very important. In the 21st century today, the greatest tragedy would be that Pentecost, Pentecost is going to become something in a museum where they say they've got pictures of holy rollers and people jumping up and down and dancing and praising and stuff like that. That's going to be the... That's going to be, that's going to be a tragedy. If we, if we settle down into our, our religious comfort zone and let that happen and not let them know that God himself said, I will send my spirit. Take a look at this. It just proves it. It is just proof. Listen. In the book of Job, I will pour out my spirit. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. And even on your man servants and your maid servants. Yes, women. I will pour out my spirit in those days. Isaiah 39, 19. Isaiah 39, 19. Thou shalt see a fierce people. A people of a deeper speech than thou can perceive. Of stammering tongue that thou cannot understand. 600 years before Jesus is even born. John the Baptist says, I baptize you in water for your sins to God. But someone is coming soon after me. And he is greater than I. So much greater that I am not worthy to be a slave and carry his sandals. He will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. Then Jesus says in John 14, 16. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate and he will be with you. John chapter 15 and 26. When the advocate comes, who I, who I, who I will send you. From the Father, the Spirit of truth that goes out. He will testify about me. Everything that I've done and everything that I've said. Many people see this and they say, well, that was then and this is now. I don't see clothes of fire on people's heads, so I guess it's not for now. Acts chapter 2 in the upper room, tongues of clothes and fire came upon their heads as a sign of the authority of a new covenant. Acts chapter 4. Peter speaking to 3,000, what shall we do? They repent and they're baptized in the spirit with no evidence of speaking. Excuse me, with no fire, but with the evidence of speaking in tongues. What does that tell you? The fire doesn't come every time. The covenant's been made. The covenant's been sealed. The covenant's been done. And now it's time for us, folks. I'm telling you, it's time for us to get back into the Holy Ghost, to get back into praying, to get back into seeking God, to get back into tongue speaking, speaking in tongues, speaking in tongues and letting the Holy Spirit move upon your heart and fill you from the inside and speak right through you. Speak things that you don't even know, things that you don't even understand. And I'm telling you, this is for the bad man and the good man and the believer and the backslider and the guy across the street, the guy I can't stand. This is for everybody that we would be filled with the Holy Spirit. Come to a knowledge of Jesus. Be filled with the Holy Spirit and then have the power. He says, when you receive the power of the Holy Spirit, you will have power to witness for me. 
I can't do this walk unless I got the Holy Ghost. I can't do this walk unless I feel the presence of the Holy Ghost. I can't believe in faith unless I've got the power of the Holy Ghost. I tell you today, today's the day when you need to get together. Some say stammering lips, say this, say that. I'm not going to tell you to say this and say that. I'm going to say let's do what they did in the upper room. They prayed. You got to pray. And you got to pray past yourself. When you're praying and you find that your prayer is, is all about you or somebody, you got to pray outside that box. You got to pray for a passion for Jesus, a passion for God, a passion for the Holy Ghost, a passion to be filled, a passion for that old time vacuum to be filled from the inside so that you can walk in a manner that is circumspect and pleasing to the Lord our God. That's what we need to do. We need to get praying. We need to get praying every day, every night, in the shower, as we're walking, as we're talking. Say, Holy Spirit, come down on me. Holy Spirit, promise of the Father, come down on me. Holy Spirit, come down on me. Fill me. Fill me, Lord. Fill the people around. Let me be so over full that the people around me, they're going to get it too. People can't be near me unless they get wet, Father. I know I have the Holy Spirit, but now I want to be filled to all overflowing I want to be filled in you so today on Pentecost Sunday I would ask you to think about Pentecost think about all the tombs that were open think about on the very day that Jesus said it is finished resurrection started tombs burst open people started coming up you follow me and I'm glad that I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit. If you are not baptized in the Holy Spirit out there, I want you to begin praying today. I want you to be in one accord. There's no magic bullet to this. This is just an open heart, a completely vacant, just uh, just an open heart saying, God, I believe, I, I believe that this is not a promise of the old by all the doctrines I've heard. I can't win that doctrine. This is a promise that you gave me. Isaiah says 600 years, even before Jesus had been born and with stammering lips and stammering speech, they will speak this powerful people. That's us. That's us. That wasn't only for them. In the Acts chapter 4, those people got saved and there were no fire on top. What are we waiting for? Get baptized in the Holy Spirit and see the strength and the power and the love and the passion that even on your worst day, you'll find a silver lining. Even on the worst day, the Holy Spirit is going to give you joy. Even on your worst time of finding something out, God is going to show you why you had to go through that lesson. Even though you go through some suffering, God is going to show you at the end, someone else is suffering and I let you suffer so that you could lead them through. It's all about witnessing. It's all about glorifying God. It's not about me. Simon the sorcerer. Simon the sorcerer. He went to them and he said, Hey, hey, I want this power to heal. Hey, I want this power to make people talk in tongues. Hey, I want this power to have miracles done. And they said to him, You shall never have this power. This power is to glorify God and to glorify God only. If you're trying to glorify yourself and do a miracle, it's not for you. It's so that God can get all the glory. And now if there's anybody out there and you do not know Jesus, which is the first step, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Father in heaven, I come before you in Jesus' name, and I pray that you will take away my sins, the wrongdoing I've done. Everyone's done something wrong. I stole cookies too. And forgive me, Lord, of the life I'm living in, of the addiction, of the affliction, of the pain, of the distraction, of this, everything. And come into my heart and be my Lord and my Savior. I confess my sins to you. Lord, this is more than just words. I pray that you will touch my heart with it. This is more than just words. So I pray that you will. I'm a follower of yours. And then, Lord, fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your spirit. Thank you, Lord. Father in heaven, I thank you. Church, time to reflect. As we reflect, I'm going to ask if 12 would bring me up uh, the offering plate. And there's some prayer requests I've got here. And um, Ray Seidel, 
is asking for prayer for his neighbor's wife and kids. Uh, Ray, uh, you know, I hope that you don't mind, but I know that Ray has uh, uh, just a friend that, that, that he met there when he moved into his little farmhouse down there. And, and just he was like a friend and a mentor and just, you know, just, uh, just a good old guy, you know, a good friend, a very close, close friend to Ray. And I know Ray misses him, so I pray for you too, Ray. But I'm sure that his wife and his kids are just going crazy right now. So, Father, we pray for this family, Lord, and pray that as Ray stands in the gap and shows that love of Jesus Christ and, and Lord, Heather as well, Lord God, as they just share love and share joy and share hope and share kindness and and uh, and just and just kind of be there for them as though they're their sons and daughters, that you would just bless them, Lord God. Keep them strong. Keep them safe. Keep them healthy, Lord. In this time that's kind of frustrating, just, just, uh, I pray that you would be with them, Lord, in a special way. Our sister Miriam asked for her little sister, a Lorraine, uh, Cologne, that leaves up for Texas today for training, uh, before she gets, uh, deployed. Father, we pray for Lorraine Cologne. I was in the Marines, so I, I'm, I'm proud of anyone who serves. And, and um, I pray that you will be safe. I pray that you will not be scared of those people who are instructing you. They're not there to try to hurt you. They're trying to train you and so that you would be strong. I pray for the family. I pray for Miriam, Lord, as they stay back and they have to see the little baby go out into what we consider to be a military, a battlefield. Their end goal is to have war to give us our temporary freedom. Jesus gives us our eternal freedom. But we pray for her. Father, be with her in Lorraine, Lord, as she goes to get her training for her deployment. And then the other one, please pray for a 19-year-old man. His name is Blake and his family. He died uh, yesterday. And uh, 19 years old. George Floyd. I was, I was, uh, I don't know if you saw my Facebook. I was at the, uh, at the rallies here in Allentown, which were very nice, by the way, were very kind. A couple of people got a little edgy with their wording, but, but it was very kind and awesome and uh, respectful. And um, it was good. And so I applaud them for that. They, they did awesome. But um, I think in all the noise and the burning and the looting and everything, I forgot about George Floyd. I forgot about the poor man who had eight minutes and 52 seconds of somebody uh, kneeling on his neck. And uh, I think there needs to be some change. I think we need to vote. I think we need to vote people in who are, are saying, look, color and experientially so that we can make those changes effectively. So I pray for them. I also pray for Charlie, as I do every week, and for Miriam, for Pastor Bev. Got some news about her legs that uh, maybe there's some new treatments, and we pray for them. I pray for uh, Leanne, who has just been, uh, she has just been uh, overworked. <laughs> she works from home, and that means she probably never stops working, but that you'd be with her, Lord, and be with all of our other friends, too. And, and, and yet, right, one more, Cindy. Cindy has got to go for this heart stuff and she goes and she gets monitored and everything and has to do exercises and just pray that she treats her body kindly and well okay so i i just thank you for that Trump. father in heaven we thank you for this offering lord we thank you lord some people uh yes right my wife has already put ours in there good uh oh trell and um, debbie i'm sure and, and 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 so i thank you you know for this offering as always, if you go to City Limits Assembly of God in Allentown, Facebook, in Allentown, not Nashville, in Allentown, Pennsylvania, Facebook, uh, you'll find us and you'll see our textable. Textable is just a text that you type in and type in the amount and then just end. It's only a one-time shot. If you want to do it next week, do it again. It won't be a recurring thing. The other thing is to send a check to City Limits Assembly of God at 302 on Ridge Avenue, Allentown, Pennsylvania, 
18102. And I'll make sure somebody puts that up on the site. Father, we pray for this offering and pray that you bless it for your work and your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, those of you who are giving. Hey, church, I want you, uh, I want you wives to, uh, to help me a little bit. I was out in the parking lot. I had five men out there and uh, had a big box of donuts and a box of coffee. Men's ministry. A bunch of, a bunch of masks. That's our men's ministry. I just want a, a 15 minute prayer time with you just, just so we can see each other's faces and say hello and, and ask how each other's families are. Men, I need y'all to uh, give me a call or text me and tell me to give you a call when you come out of work, whatever, anything that works, but you call me. Please be sure to tune in for Pastor Sherry. Pastor Sherry does the uh, kids program. She does a wonderful job, outstanding job. Every week it's getting better and better and better. And so I thank you for that. Please pray for our pastors, uh, Pastor Andrea, Pastor Bev, and Pastor, and Pastor Heather. As, as they are uh, starting to hook up our new team and get our new board members, pray for our board members as we try to figure out how we're going to restart this place and uh, how it's going to be clean, the spacing and the seating at the open door, things like that. So I'll be giving you some live COVID-19 updates, okay? Let me pray for you. Pentecost Sunday, the Spirit came down, a loud wind, Tongues of fire to show that it was the new covenant. That Jesus, because he was leaving them, was going to send the spirit back to be our advocate and our comforter till he comes again. A down payment. Father in heaven, I pray that you will show people to either tag this message or forward it to a friend who doesn't understand Pentecost, Lord. And I pray that they would view it again maybe from beginning to end to make sure they didn't miss anything check the scripture out and i thank you father thank you for pentecost sunday lord in jesus name i pray that the lord will shine upon you that his peace will be with you that the lord will graciously keep you strong and he'll keep you healthy and we pray all these things in jesus name amen Pastor Jim out.